Well, certainly a, a great deal to talk about today. Uh, just a quick reminder, I was if you heard my, uh, my, my, my pre-show tease, I mentioned a friend of mine in Alabama sat down to watch the debate last night. She's quite politically astute, and, and this is the type of thing that would interest her. She's not a Democrat, I should point out, but still, it's the type of thing that would interest her. <laughs> she, she fell asleep watching it. It was so dry. And she said she she was a, that the dog woke her up. The dog wanted to go out for a walk. So she she apparently caught the end of the debate because of that reason. But it was a great time for napping for a lot of people. We'll get to that in just a couple of minutes. Some of the other things coming up. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Tripp will be talking cancer with us between 8.30 and 9 o'clock this morning. Prevention mainly. Also, speaking of cancer, just after the 9 o'clock news, uh, we're going to have Dr. Robert Lobb back with us. We're talking about breast cancer awareness issues today. If you have not yet done it, did you know that the wellness tree here in Twin Falls, for every dollar donated, that can help treat 10 women, do some screenings for them, who may, who may have breast cancer. At least it's a, it's a way to help out some people in this community who, who really need it. And you can donate if you go to our website, newsradio1310.com. You click on that pink ribbon around the edges of the website. It'll give you details. So if you think about that, if you donate just $10, you can help out 100 women in this community and maybe prolong someone's life. That would be a good thing. Eight minutes after 8 o'clock, Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Oh, and new transgender rules at Twin Falls Schools. We'll tell you about those in the next hour. But in the meantime, debate last night. Now, I, I don't know how many of you actually decided to put up with this. I was listening online, and I wasn't watching the actual, the the faces, and the you know you you get a lot from the nuances out of that. That the people people on stage will it's, sometimes it's a look, the way they look at a competitor, or the way they react to a question. You can read more in the face, but still, I, I happen to hear a lot of it verbally, and of course, that's what I do for a living. And I, I'm trying to make some conclusions this morning. A lot of people are handicapping it about winners and losers, but most people. It, it, Unlike the previous Republican debates, it seems that there's very much a general general agreement about who did well last night and who did not do well. I have some of the closing statements from the assorted candidates here, and I will tell you right now, this is from the Washington Times. It's uh, winners and losers, but it's almost identical to what you see over at the Hill newspaper. They have Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton as the winners, and even Joe Biden because he didn't show up but also Donald Trump because he was live-tweeting during the whole thing, and that was probably more entertaining than the event. And the losers being uh, Lincoln Chafee from Rhode Island, Jim Webb from Virginia, and Martin O'Malley from Maryland. These are some of the closing statements last night. This is Senator Bernie Sanders from Vermont, the admitted Democratic Socialist, whatever that means. You're either a Democrat or a Socialist, right? Uh, But he says that he is a Democratic Socialist. This is Sanders speaking in his wrap-up. Nobody up here certainly no Republican, can address the major crises facing our country unless millions of people begin to stand up to the billionaire class that has so much power over our economy and our political life. Can I tell you something? Of course, I worked in Vermont for a while as a broadcaster. I was a television news director there about 15 years ago. Bernie Sanders at the time was serving in the U.S. House. He had not yet moved over to the U.S. Senate. People there, even Republicans, consider him to be a very honest man. So you don't have to worry about integrity. You just have to worry about some of his ideas when he says he'll make college free. Nothing is free, folks. Nothing. He wants to spend another $18 trillion putting us in debt to buy a whopping $36 trillion at that point, I suppose. On the other hand, his opposition to the trade agreement, the TPP agreement that was just finalized, or is being finalized, matches up exactly with Pat Buchanan from the right. So some of his ideas about Wall Street and about trade agreements, there are a lot of conservatives who nod their heads and say, okay, I at least understand that part of it. This is Senator Jim Webb. He is uh, no longer in the U.S. Senate, former Marine officer, served in Vietnam. He has shrapnel in a knee, in his kidneys, and in his head from his service there. He is uh, a Navy Cross winner, also a Silver Star winner. A Bronze Star winner. I mean, he's got a tremendous resume. Former Navy Secretary. Was not well liked by the Navy, by the way. And this is his wrap up. I did it in Vietnam. I did it in the Pentagon. I did it in the Senate. And if you will help me overcome this cavalcade of, of financial 
irregularities and money that is poisoning our political process, I am ready to do that for you in the White House. That's Jim Webb uh, speaking, uh, and he did not get a lot of time last night. He complained about that. It does seem that these debates are not set up to give the candidates equal time. Well, the polling data shows we should focus on, well, then how is anybody supposed to make any traction? I think that the, the underdogs have a good argument there. There was a candidate on stage last night. You may remember her. She played a character in a TV show called H.R. Puff and Stuff, and she was always trying to steal the magic flute. This is her closing statement. I think what you did see is that in this debate, we tried to deal with some of the very tough issues facing our country. That's in stark contrast to the Republicans. Ooh, ooh, those baddies over on the Republican side. Yeah, while I'm, while I'm uh, getting all sorts of dirt on my opponents here on stage, let me tell you how bad the Republicans are. Uh, then Lincoln Chafee from Rhode Island. Uh, Chafee is an unusual guy. He is a very liberal guy when it comes to social issues. When he was actually serving in Washington, Chafee was considered to be very fiscally conservative. So uh, kind of a split personality here in his politics. I did it as mayor. I know how to get legislation passed through Congress because I did it as a senator. I know how to turn around a state because I did it as governor of Rhode Island. But what I'm most proud of is that in 30 years of public service, I have had no scandals. Apparently that's why nobody knows who he is. (laughs) Speaking of nobody knowing who you are, Martin O'Malley recently was governor of Maryland, no longer the governor of that state. He was term limited. He was on the stage as well last night. On this stage, you didn't hear anyone uh, denigrate women. You didn't hear anyone make racist comments about new American immigrants. You didn't hear anyone speak ill of another American because of their religious belief. What you heard instead on this stage tonight was an honest search for the answers that will move our country forward. Ah, yes, a nice warm feeling for Martin O'Malley and all the other hand-holding liberals around the country as he claims that the opposition on the Republican side are all racist bigots. It's 814. Bill Colley with you this morning on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com 47. If you weren't watching this last night, you could have seen the Chicago Cubs, formerly my favorite baseball team. I threw them overboard years ago. I got so upset with the constant heartbreak. But they, en- they upended perhaps the best team in baseball, the St. Louis Cardinals, in a playoff. So a lot of people weren't even watching this debate. There was a statistic that was quoted, I think it was on Drudge last night, that said about half of Americans didn't even know this debate was taking place. This was a poll from over the weekend. <laughs> and in fact, only 47% of Democrats knew it was taking, taking place. That number was like 51% overall, which means more Republicans knew that Democrats were debating last night on the Clinton News Network than Democrats did. Doesn't Rush Limbaugh talk about that thing? Uh, about voters, where he talks about those uh, low-information types. Yes, he's referring to the Democrat Party, and it's uh, it's rank and file. We have a caller with us. You're on the air. The number, by the way, 736-0300, and you're up next with Bill Colley on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Good morning, Bill. They, they, they almost offered enough free stuff in that debate last night to, to switch me over to the dark side. I mean, my crime, when he talk about an out-free-each-other event, <laughs> and, uh, of course, evil Wall Street, and day traders, and investment bankers, those, they're going to pay for everything in this country, and uh, that'll solve all of our problems. I, I read, a, but read a I figure just summed it up time. for everybody who didn't watch it. I read a figure one time, get this, it said that if we took away all the money, emptied all the bank accounts and all of the, the, the investments that the, the 1% supposedly have in this country, or even the top 10%, uh, we would spend that all in about six months, and then what would we do? We wouldn't even have those people left to tax any longer. Yeah. Yep. Take care, Bill. Hey, thank you much for the telephone call. It is seven three six zero three hundred. If you have a thought or two on last night's debate, Ron Fournier, who is a former Clinton ally, writing at National Journal this morning, says Clinton told many, many lies. If you get a chance, go to Real Clear Politics. That, that website, similar to Drudge, actually, it's a little bit more modern looking. Drudge hasn't changed in twenty years. But if you go to Real Clear Politics, you will find a link. The, the, the stories at the top, they have a list of 10 or 12 stories that are popular this morning or opinion pieces. Ron Fournier at National Journal writing about Hillary Clinton, and he, he cites, he breaks it down and says she had a lot of fibs last night. One of the most important ones was on this, this trade agreement. Of course, she says, I didn't flip-flop on it. Everybody changes their minds. But he explains 
She said when it when it was being developed in 2013 and I was still Secretary of State, I said I hoped that it would bring us, you know, a great agreement and the like. And he said, well, she didn't say that at the time. The words I hope were never in there. She came right out and stated this was going to be a good agreement for American workers. Now she says it's going to be a bad agreement for American workers. Then there is another piece I read this morning in the Wall Street Journal. I believe it might be Brett Stevens. I'll have to go back and look at the writer. But I read this piece this morning as I was eating my breakfast, and the writer says, Democrats surveyed, of all people, overwhelmingly support this trade agreement, which a great many conservatives don't. They feel it's it's just simply going to be, as Ross Perot pointed out way back with NAFTA, create a giant sucking sound that is your jobs leaving this country. In other words, Pat Buchanan put it this way last Friday night on the McLaughlin Group. He said, You've got people in Vietnam who are working for pennies a day. This agreement will now allow companies from the United States, those that still remain here, to go to Vietnam and have these people build those products for pennies a day, which they will then try to turn around and sell to you again, even though you may no longer have a job. How is this going to benefit anyone? And yet Democrats, who claim to be the party of big unions and the like, and the American worker, Apparently, overwhelmingly, rank and file support this agreement. Once again, it goes back to that line from Rush Limbaugh, low information voters, dumber than rocks, I think is probably the best way to put it, dumber than boxes of rocks, dumber than posts, whatever you like to say, the, 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 the train doesn't get to the station, the elevator doesn't get to the top floor, they're not the sharpest tools in the shed, they're not the brightest bulbs in the, uh, in the light or the constellation. Uh, they're two beers short of a six-pack. Whatever you'd like to say, 818, Bill Colley with you on Top Story. And you're up next on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. What's on your mind? What a fresh breath of debate yesterday. It wasn't that gas baggery stuff that we hear from the Republicans. Well, break down what you mean by gas baggery. I mean, you know, you can say gas baggery on the air, but what do you mean by it? What do you mean by it? What was what was fresh last night about five dull people standing on the stage? Hello? So, you know, I, I don't have a problem taking some dingling's call as long as the dingling can flesh out what they're talking about. Gas baggery? Uh, all right, we, we, we've got an $18 trillion debt. All of you geniuses on the American left, you tell me, how much longer can we go on with that? At what point does somebody suddenly say, hey, you know, we can't pay our bills any longer. We've maxed out the credit card. And then all of those freebies and those goodies that you're expecting, Santa Claus won't be coming. 20 minutes after 8 o'clock. I realize that's a lot to process because if you say that, you're just being mean. But all of us in our personal lives know you can't go max out your credit lines and then expect to keep borrowing. And you got to pay it back at some point if you're responsible. 20 after 8 o'clock. Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. It's 48. Hey, Dr. Jonathan Tripp joining us in the next half hour. He'll be here between 8 30 and 9 o'clock this morning. As I mentioned, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Jonathan Tripp. He's talking about cancer prevention in the next half hour between 8 30 and 9 o'clock. We call it Better Health with Tripp Family Medicine. We do it every Wednesday morning between 8 30 and 9 o'clock, and the medical professionals are here and they're available to take your telephone calls. And if you've got a question or comment, you may know someone or it may be yourself, and the doctor is going to try to direct you in the right, uh, th- going to point you in a direction, in fact, that perhaps can be uh, be very good for your health, maybe even life-saving. So that's coming up a little bit later today, a few minutes from now. Also, we've got a, a segment on breast cancer awareness just after 9 o'clock news today. And remember, when it comes to Trip Family Medicine, they're looking for new patients. They're actually looking for new staff, too, as well, located on Fillmore Street, directly across from the main post office in Twin Falls, and life's too short not to feel good. Talking about this uh, this Democrat debate last night, there there was a lot of discussion about Wall Street. Uh, Hillary Clinton can't get too deeply into that because Wall Street funds her campaign as well as her family's foundation. Uh, that that may have been left out during some of the debate because they waited over an hour to ask her any questions about email or Benghazi, and when they get to that, perhaps in a future debate, she may not fare quite so well. But this is Bernie Sanders. Believe that he got into a little bit of a snit with her on some of these issues last night. In my view, Secretary Clinton, 
You do not, Congress does not regulate Wall Street. Wall Street regulates Congress. And we have got to break off these banks. Going to them so, and saying, please do the right thing no, that's is not what, kind of that, naive. Look, I think Dodd-Frank was a very it. good start. And I think that we have to implement it. We have to prevent the Republicans from ripping it apart. We have to save the Consumer Financial Protection Board, which is finally beginning to act to protect consumers. We have work to do. You'll get no argument from me. I was so, I'm listening to this. Here's something to that I think a lot of us probably, if you were listening last night, you heard. You heard Dodd-Frank. You also heard Glass-Steagall. Now, how many people do you think actually watching a debate can sit there and actually tell you, could, could, could you turn to your friend or your spouse, whoever you were watching with, and say, can you explain Glass-Steagall to me? Or how about Dodd-Frank? When I listen to politicians talk, they talk in this language, and yet nobody really knows. We have some notion Dodd-Frank was done for banking regulations. And it has driven a lot of your small community banks out of business. Uh, that has been one of those, quote, unforeseen consequences, unquote. And then you hear Glass-Steagall, which goes back, good gosh, what, 80 years? Somewhere in that, that range as well? Okay, Martin O'Malley mentioned Glass-Steagall. What is it? So I, I guess you're supposed to be odd that they keep using all of these names. But we don't really have any explanation of what it means. Sanders, by the way, says he is no friend of big banks. In the 1990s, when I had the Republican leadership and Wall Street spending billions of dollars in lobbying, when the Clinton administration, when Alan Greenspan said, what a great idea it would be to allow these huge banks to merge, Bernie Sanders fought them and helped lead the opposition to deregulation. Bernie Sanders fought them. Do you ever remember the Jimmy episode of Seinfeld? Jimmy doesn't like it when someone talks to him that way. Jimmy doesn't like it. <laughs> uh, Bernie, uh, <clears throat> you're, you're standing right there. You, you don't need to say Bernie Sanders doesn't like it. Jim Webb, meanwhile, who got very little attention from the moderators and the inquisitors, I pointed out earlier, a, a veteran of Vietnam, uh, wounded in Vietnam, a, a man with scads and scads of medals for his service, served under Ronald Reagan as well. I don't know why he's even in the Democrat Party. In fact, he says the Democrat Party has gotten too liberal for him. Uh, the fact of the matter is, of the Democrat Party, 20% of them consider themselves liberals surveyed in 2000. Today, it's 41%. So the number of liberals in the Democrat Party obviously growing, uh, people looking to take something from someone else. This is Jim Webb, though, and Jim Webb is trying to, to outline his qualifications. I spent t years as Assistant Secretary of Defense, Secretary of the Navy in the Reagan administration. In the Senate... I spoke about economic fairness and social justice from day one. I also wrote and passed the best piece of veterans education legislation in history, the post 9-11 GI Bill. I brought criminal justice reform. He is the only candidate last night when asked if black lives matter to say, no, all lives matter. I suspect that when he was commanding troops in Vietnam and he looked out at his fellow Marines, he didn't see white, black, brown, tan, red, yellow. He just saw Marines. So it was quite stunning to have someone, because candidates have been saying this at rallies when they've attempted. O'Malley said it one time, and then they, the, crowd, uh, the crowd got unruly with him, and then he backed down, showing his cowardice. And the, the writer at uh, Daily Caller says that Webb had this to say, as a president of the United States, every life in the country matters. The only candidate last night to actually say that. You know that when he was Navy Secretary, he got bounced because they were trying to cut back on the size of the Navy. He was actually looking to expand the Navy to 600 ships. So as he left that job in 1988, a lot of people were angry with him in Washington, and Ronald Reagan made a comment in his diaries. He said that the Navy won't be unhappy to see Jim Webb go, apparently because he was putting so much pressure on them, and he was trying to redesign fighting forces and the like, and he, he redesigned the Marine Corps as a fighting force, which allowed the Marine Corps to go into uh, to Iraq in uh, in the war to liberate Kuwait in 1990 91 and really clean house. A28, Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. And CNN kept an empty lectern last night just in case Joe Biden would show up, even though he's not an announced candidate. And you wonder is the network trying to promote his candidacy? Nah, it's the Clinton News Network. It's not BNN. It's not Biden News Network. 
A writer today over at Washington Times <laughs> by the name of Charles Hurt says, the empty lecturer also never voted to send American troops to die and get disfigured in a war that she didn't really actually believe in, a war that uh, was later determined so disastrously hopeless that she was instrumental in surrendering it to the most dangerous jihadi terrorist the world has ever seen. He goes on to say he supports the empty lecturer because nor did she spark protests that killed countless people around the world by falsely blaming a coordinated terrorist attack at an American embassy on outrage over a two-bit crank film about the Prophet Muhammad that nobody saw until she made it famous. The empty lecturer is open, true, and honest. She has never hidden Rose Law Firm records or stashed an unsecured server in her bathroom to keep her employer from reading all of the dastardly dealings she was doing over government email. Yep, well said. And we'll get to that in some future debate, won't we? 8.30, Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. 48, Dr. Jonathan Tripp on the way in just a couple of minutes from Tripp Family Medicine right here in Twin Falls, Idaho.